Welcome to the session on sale of goods and property law. Today, we'll be covering the legislations as well as legal aspects relating to transactions about sale of goods and property transactions. In India, the sale of movable goods and the transfer of immovable property are governed by various acts. The contract for such sale or transfer are governed by the general provisions of the Indian Contract Act and specific provisions of other legislations like the Sale of Goods and the Transfer of Property Act. The Sale of Goods Act is the primary enactment applicable to the transactions relating to movable property and the Transfer of Property Act is the primary legislation dealing with the transfer of immovable property between two parties. In today's session, we will be dividing the topics into four parts. The first part, we will be dealing with the meaning and the definition of the term property. The second part, we will be looking at the kinds of property. In the third part, we will be looking at sale of goods and the legal aspects relating to sale of goods. And in the fourth part, we will be looking at the transfer of immovable property. The last part, we will be covering intellectual property and the legal aspects relating to intellectual property. The first part, we will be discussing meaning of the term property. Now, there have been various interpretations and definitions given by jurists for the term property. In order to understand the scope and the nature of various laws governing property and transactions that are related to property, one first must have an understanding of what the term property connotes and what the term property connotes in a legal sense. According to an eminent jurist, Salman, the term property could be understood in any one of the three following senses. First, the term property includes all legal rights of a person. Now, what do you mean by this? This is to say that it includes the complete ownership of a man on material as well as incorporeal things, right? So this is one of the interpretations given by Salmon. The second interpretation is that the term property includes not just a man's personal rights, which is rights over one's body. So this is not relating to a man's personal rights, but only his proprietary rights, right? So the right over one's material possession is what is construed as property in the second interpretation and not a person's personal rights, right? So this one must understand is a very simplistic division, right? Because practically personal rights and proprietary rights are not so clearly demarcated. This is one of the interpretations given by Salmon. The third interpretation that is given by Salmon is that the term property includes the rights of ownership in material things such as buildings, land, goods, etc. Right? Another jurist, Austin, proposed that property denotes the greatest right to enjoyment known to the law, including servitudes. What do you mean by this? The jurist Austin stated that a right by which something, such as a piece of land owned by a person, can be used and enjoyed by that specific person in any sense. And property denotes not just the ownership over that particular land or corporal thing, but also enjoyment of that specific tangible thing that we are talking about. So this is another interpretation that is given by Austin with respect to what do you mean by property or what the term property connotes. What is important to note here is that the Indian court's perspective of what really constitutes this property, right? So we'll be looking at one of the cases that talks about what is meant by the term property or the concept of property. This is the case of R.C. Cooper versus Union of India, wherein the Supreme Court interpreted the concept of property to include both corporeal things which means tangible or physical things such as land, furniture and also incorporeal things such as copyrights, patents and other intellectual properties. These are all terms that are important from the context of property law. We will be looking at all of these terms in detail in the upcoming parts. Property has also been defined in various legislations. For example, the Benami Transactions Prohibition Act states that property means property of any kind, whether movable, immovable, tangible or intangible and includes any right or interest in such property. 
this you can see is a very wide definition of what really connotes as property and it has used multiple different types of property or kinds of property to include what really the term connotes. Looking at the various different interpretations of the term property, we will now move on to the part two of the session which looks at different kinds of property. Okay? So there are various categorizations of property which are important from the perspective of application of a given legislation. Right? So there are three broad categories we will be looking at and these are corporal and incorporal property, movable and immovable property and the last one which is intellectual property. Now the first categorization is corporal and incorporal property. Corporal property is also known as tangible property, right? something that can be touched or felt. It refers to material things such as furniture, clothing, jewelry, art, ornaments, household items. Incorporal property on the other hand refers to intangible property, right? property that cannot be moved, touched or felt but instead it represents something of value such as negotiable instruments, copyrights, uh, trademark and other intellectual and uh, properties. The second categorization that is important is that of movable and immovable property. Now all tangible or corporal property can either be divided into movable or immovable, right? So here we are talking about tangible or physical property and the categorization of tangible physical or corporal property can be done into two parts which is either movable or immovable in nature. Movable property has been defined in multiple legislations. One of the definitions that is important here is that of the General Clauses Act which states that immovable property includes land, benefits that arise out of land and things attached to the earth or permanently fastened to anything attached to the earth. Right. So this is a definition that has been given with respect to what immovable property means. One must note that the definition given under the General Clauses Act is not an exhaustive definition, meaning it does not include all types of immovable property, but it is an inclusive definition, meaning that it indicates what types of properties are considered to be immovable property. Another definition that can be looked at in order to understand what immovable property means in the Indian legal scenario is the Registration Act. The Registration Act defines immovable property to include, again, land, buildings, hereditary allowances, right to way, which is also known as, known as easementary rights, fisheries or any other benefit that arise out of land and things that are attached to the earth. Right. So this is a slightly broader definition of that given under the General Clauses Act. It also not just includes the different types of property that we are looking at, but also other rights that are associated to the property, such as the right to weigh and the right to any benefits that arise out of the land. So this is a wider definition that we are looking at. The above definitions that I have spoken about are quite comprehensive. Though various definitions of immovable property exists, they all exist for the purpose of a specific legislation or the application of a specific legislation. The second categorization that we spoke about was immovable versus movable property. Now we look at what movable property connotes in the Indian legal scenario. Section 3 of the General Clauses Act again defines what movable property means. It states that movable property is property of every description except immovable property. Since the definition of immovable property has already comprehensively been given under the General Clauses Act, the definition of movable property states that anything that is not immovable property would be considered as movable property. Right? Section 2 of the Registration Act also looks at what movable property is and it states that standing timber growing crops and grass, fruits and property of any other description except immovable property can be construed as movable property. This again is not an exhaustive definition. It is an inclusive definition indicating what types of properties are considered to be movable properties and most importantly stating that anything that is immovable property in exception to that those things would be considered to be movable property.
right so this is the second categorization that we dealt with which is movable versus immovable property the third and the last categorization is that of intellectual property if you remember the first categorization that we dealt with was corporeal versus incorporeal which means tangible versus intangible property and the same is applicable when we are talking about intellectual property intellectual property is a form of incorporeal or intangible property right and it refers to various distinct types of creations of the mind for which proprietary rights are recognized these rights are protected by various intellectual property legislations such as the copyright act the patent act and the trademark act and there are many other acts that deal with various types of intellectual property rights in part 3 of today's session we'll be looking at the laws applicable to sale of goods the sale of goods act of 1930 is the primary enactment applicable to transactions relating to movable property so here we're talking about movable property and these movable properties that are specified as goods under the sale of goods act are governed by the sale of goods act of 1930 Prior to the enactment of the Sale of Goods Act, the specific provisions with respect to the sale of movable goods were a part of the Indian Contract Act. But it was felt that there is a requirement of a specific legislation governing transactions relating to movable property. Therefore, a specific law called the Sale of Goods Act was enacted, and the provisions mentioned regarding the same under the Indian Contract Act were repealed. However one must note that the general provisions of the Indian Contract Act are still applicable to the sale of goods contract what do we mean by this it means that all the general principles with respect to contract formation and execution are still applicable in this case which is mentioned under the Indian Contract Act meaning any contract which is any contract even relating to the sale of movable goods entered into India must satisfy the criteria that have been laid down under the Indian Contract Act for what constitutes as a valid contract for a sale of goods agreement to be valid it must be entered into freely by parties capable of entering into contract so the capacity aspect needs to be there the contract must have a lawful object a lawful consideration and must not expressly be declared to be void under indian law so these are all the basic requirements that are there with respect to any contract uh, executed within the territory of india and it will also apply to the sale of goods contract as well a contract for the sale of goods is created when an offer to buy or sell goods is made for a particular price and when that offer is accepted then a contract of sale of goods is created A contract of sale of goods can be made in writing or orally. It can also be implied from the conduct of the parties. Now, the rules governing various aspect in a contract of sale of goods, such as the price, the time, the place, and the method of the delivery of the goods, along with other specific aspects that are particular to the sale of goods, such as passing of risk with respect to the goods. the passing of the ownership with respect to the goods and the rights and liabilities of the buyers or sellers as well as remedies uh, for the breach of a contract of sale are provided under the specific legislation which is the sale of goods act another legislation that is important when we are talking about the sale of goods is the registration act why is this legislation important this legislation is important because it talks about the registration requirements of various legal documents and the registration of a sale of goods contract is also something that we should pay attention to under the registration act one must note that the registration of a sale of goods contract is optional so it is not mandatory to register a sale of goods contract even if a sale of goods contract is not registered under the registration act it would still considered to be valid in the eyes of law section 18d talks about the registration of a sale of goods contract it states that the registration of any instrument that purports or operates to create declare assign limit or extinguish any right title or interest to or in a movable property is optional 
So this is not just the sale of a good contract that we are talking about, but any contract that talks about movable property and talks about assigning rights or assigning any kind of uh, uh, right, title or interest with respect to the movable property, all of those documents come under the ambit of section 18 and all of these documents do not require mandatory registration. So these type of documents relating to movable goods are not mandatorily required to be registered under the Registration Act. Part 4 of today's session, we will be looking at the transfer of immovable property. We looked at movable property as governed by the Sale of Goods Act as well as the Indian Contract Act. Now we will be looking at immovable property and the laws associated to the transfer of immovable property. In India, transactions for purchasing, selling, transferring or creating any kind of interest in immovable property are governed by several laws, rules and regulations. Land is a subject that falls within the powers of the state government under the constitution, which is Schedule 7, List 2. And therefore, uh, laws relating to uh, land and property differ from state to state. So you must understand that there is no one specific legislation that deals with immovable property. There are multiple regulations, rules and legislations that talk about immovable property. And different states have varying legislations with respect to property. But apart from state laws, the central government can also legislate on matters relating to acquisition and ownership of property. So uh, this is there because uh, all such matters fall within the concurrent list, which is the seven schedule list three, right? So the central government under list three can legislate on matters relating to acquisition and ownership of property. And uh, this is governed uh, uh, this can be governed both by central as well as state legislation. But one specific legislation that we will be focusing on that talks about the transfer of immovable property and one of the primary legislations dealing with the transfer of immovable property is the Transfer of Property Act. Right. So the Transfer of Property Act talks about the transfer of immovable property between two parties. Both the parties involved in the transaction, one must note, need to be alive for the transfer under this particular act. In case of transfer of ownership of immovable property of a deceased person or a person who has passed away, succession laws as per the person's personal laws or religion will be applicable in such a case. So it is important to note that only transfer of property when both the parties are alive are covered under the Transfer of Property Act. Such trans uh, transactions are covered under the Transfer of Property Act. Now before the commencement of the Transfer of Property Act, the transfer of immovable property in India was still governed uh, by various uh, uh, aspects which is primarily uh, principles of English law and equity. So before a specific legislation with respect to transfer of immovable property, uh, the uh, aspects that were governing such transactions because such transactions of course were happening and they were also recognized in the eyes of the law but primarily it was the principles of English, English law and principles of equity that were governing such transactions. After the Transfer of Property Act, this is one of the primary legislation that basically regulates the transactions with respect to immovable property. Now the Transfer of Property Act covers various kinds of transfer. We one, one must recognize this is not just the sale of property act, this is the transfer of property act. So the word transfer involves multiple types or kinds of exchange or transfer of immovable property and is not just restricted to sale. Yes, sale is one of the types of transfer of property, but it is just one. There are multiple other types of transfers that have been mentioned under the Transfer of Property Act and the Transfer of Property Act regulates all such transfers. We look into the different types or kinds of transfer of immovable property that are mentioned under the Transfer of Property Act. One or the primary uh, uh, kind of transfer that we can talk about is sale, right? So sale means the exchange of immovable property for money consideration and the regulations with respect to the same have been given under the Transfer of Property Act. Another type of transfer that the TP Act talks about is mortgage, 
what do we mean by mortgage a mortgage is a debt instrument which is secured by collateral of a specific real estate or immovable property and these transactions relating to mortgage or anything relating to mortgage of an immovable property is also governed by the transfer of property act another type of transfer that is spoken of under the transfer of property act is lease now what do you mean by lease a lease is a legal agreement by which the owner of an immovable property allows someone else to use it for a period of time in return for money consideration so your rental agreement is usually a lease agreement or it is technically known as lease under the transfer of property act right the other type of transfer that is covered under the transfer of property act is exchange what do we mean by exchange exchange under the transfer of property act means when two persons mutually transfer the ownership of one thing in exchange for the ownership of another neither the thing or both the things being money so this is different from sale this is exchange in that case it is a the transaction means that it's a transaction of exchange when there is a transfer of ownership of a thing in exchange for the ownership of another thing and not in exchange of a money consideration right another and the last type of transfer that the transfer of property act talks about is gift so what do you mean by gift gift means that the transfer of certain existing movable and immovable property made voluntarily and without consideration by one person called the donor to the other person known as the donee so this is basically uh, uh, what gift means so here you notice that it is both movable and immovable property that have been mentioned and gift basically talks about the transfer of these movable or immovable property from one person to another not for any consideration right it is purely uh, without consideration that such a transfer is happening and gift is also regulated by the transfer of property act one must note that partition surrender easement will and family settlements don't fall under the definition of transfer under the transfer of property act and these are aspects that are governed by other legislations right so partition surrender easement all of these other aspects that don't really fall under the definition of transfer are basically governed by other legislations what do you mean by transfer under the transfer of property act or what is the definition of the word transfer under the transfer of property act section 5 of the transfer of property act defines transfer as an act by which a living person this is important conveys property in present or future to one or more living persons or to himself or one or more living persons here it is important to note that both the parties must be living persons and the property can be conveyed in the present or in future to such persons including oneself right so this is what the definition of the term property connotes and i have already mentioned the various kinds of transfers that are covered under the transfer of property act one thing you also must remember is that the term person that are used under the definition of transfer is not restricted only to human beings but also includes companies association of persons body of individuals and other juristic persons so this is not just transfer with respect to human beings or natural persons but the transfer can also happen between juristic or legal persons and it would still be covered by the transfer of property act I had spoken about registration requirements of legal documents under part 3 regarding sale of goods similar kind of requirement is there even with respect to the transfer of immovable property the transfer of immovable property first must be made in the mode that is prescribed under the transfer of property act therefore all the necessary attestations and registration requirements also have to be complied with Section 53A of the Transfer of Property Act alongside section 54 and 55 talk about the registration requirements of uh, uh, various kind of legal documents that talk about transfer of immovable property and these sections should be read alongside section 17 of the Registration Act that we'd mentioned already under the sale of goods portion now i told you that under the registration act 
registration of legal documents could either be mandatory or optional right so these are the two kinds of registration requirements that are given under the registration act that there are certain legal documents that can be uh, that are required to be mandatorily registered and there are certain legal documents that are not mandatorily required to be registered and the registration for the same is optional now in case of immovable property and the transfer of immovable property as governed by the transfer of property act section 17 is important with respect to the registration act that says that all documents such as gift deed relating to an immovable property lease of an immovable property or the contracts for the transfer of immovable property for consideration are mandatorily required to be registered right so these documents that are mentioned under the transfer of property act are mandatorily required to be registered under the registration act if one fails to register such documents it would result in the transaction not being recognized in the eyes of the law so it is important that the registration process that is given under the registration act as well as the requirement under the transfer of property act is fulfilled in order for such transactions to be recognized by law one interesting facet that i'd like to discuss with respect to the transfer of immovable property and with respect to the registration of legal documents uh, uh, regarding transfer of immovable property are the registration requirements for rental agreements or lease agreements now most of you would have noted if you've had any experience with respect to rental agreements or lease agreements that in india most rent agreements are generally signed for a period of 11 months and this you will note is across the board the term 11 months or the time duration of 11 months is something that is consistent across uh, most rental agreements why is it that the time period of 11 months is usually used in most rental agreements there is a logic behind that and there is a legal reason behind why most rental agreements have a period or a time period of 11 month that has been specified and not one year or above one year now this is because that uh, because of the fact that if uh, 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 the leasing period or the rent period goes more than 12 months then according to the registration act and according to the transfer of property act uh, registration of such a lease agreement or a rental agreement becomes mandatory right so most rental agreements have 11 months prescribed so that stamp duty and other charges could be avoided because registration does not become mandatory it only becomes mandatory when the leasing period is more than 12 months so this is an interesting fact as to why most rental agreements in india are generally for a period of 11 months and not about 12 months this is of course to avoid stamp duty and other charges which are required if the document needs to be registered under the registration act now we come to the final part of the session and in the final part we will be dis- uh, will be discussing intellectual property right so this is another form of property that we had discussed when we were talking about the classification of various kinds of property and one of the classifications that we spoke of was intellectual property now this is a very new and booming area within uh, uh, the legal fraternity for practice and it has a lot of important connotation why so we will discuss now first we will discuss what do you mean by intellectual property now intellectual property what does it refer to it refers to creations of the mind right so inventions literary or art- artistic work designs symbols names and images that have been used in commercial setups uh, over which a person or a business has some legal rights these are usually what intellectual property Uh, 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 the term is associated with right so the term intellectual property is basically referring to intangible or incorporeal property uh, which are basically creations of the mind right so all artistic literary works all inventions all of these are basically the property or the intellectual property of an individual or a business and the intellectual property law deals with the rules for securing and enforcing the legal rights that one has over one's intellectual work or creations 
so why do we have intellectual property rights these are basically rights that an individual has over his intellectual creation or over the creations that he has by using his mind right so the property law set up or the intellectual property rights law set up is basically there to protect the rights of the individuals over their works and their intellectual contributions right so just as the law protects the ownership of personal property uh, such as real estate like we had already discussed in the previous parts it also protects the exclusive control that one has over one's intangible assets or one's intellectual assets and that is where the field of intellectual property law comes in so why do we have intellectual property laws or why do we have intellectual property rights that have been assigned uh, to individuals the basic purpose uh, as to why such laws exist is to basically give an incentive to people to basically develop creative works that benefit the society and that benefits individuals as well and the incentive basically is by ensuring that these individuals can profit from their creations and their works without having the fear of someone misappropriating it right so when you have proprietary rights over one's intellectual creations or over one's work then basically it incentivizes them into incentivizes them to basically produce more such work that could be beneficial to the society so the intellectual property rights and the various intellectual property laws that exist uh, cover various types of uh, uh, creations and the common types of intellectual properties include copyrights patents designs trademarks we we'll look at some of them so what do you mean by copyright now copyright is basically uh, it's a protection that is accorded or it's a right that is accorded that protects the written or published works such as books songs films web content artistic works so copyrights are basically intellectual property rights that are associated to written or published works and the protection with respect to the same right and this is governed by the copyright act in india another type of intellectual property that is important is patent right so what do you mean by patent patent generally is an intellectual property right that protects commercial inventions so your inventions for example uh, it could be a product a business product or a process or a, or a, a drug uh the the product itself or the process to basically come up with that particular product are all inventions that can be protected under the patent regime and this is governed by the patents act another type of intellectual property that is interesting uh, is that of designs so uh, designs basically uh, means any models drawings that are associated uh, with businesses or that have a commercial aspect all of these models and designs are covered under the designs act and protection is basically accorded to them as one's creative or intellectual invention or one's creative or intellectual asset uh another type of uh, intellectual property that uh, is usually spoken of or is very commonly known is that of trademarks right so what do you mean by trademarks trademarks basically or trademark rights protect signs symbols logos words sounds that basically distinguish distinguishes one's products and services from that of their competitors right so businesses basically when they use uh, signs symbols uh, that basically dis- distinguishes them as a business uh, as opposed to their co- uh, their competitors then trademark becomes an important kind of an intellectual property uh, a right that such businesses or individuals have over the signs and symbols that are used to distinguish their business from other businesses right so these are some of the broad uh, intellectual properties that have been accorded protection under the indian legal regime and uh, some other uh, 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 rights that have also been accorded and certain other laws that are associated uh, uh, which are there under the intellectual property regime uh, are the geographical indications of goods act you have the protection of plant varieties and farmers rights act you have the information technology act so these are all specific legislations that deal with the protection of intellectual assets or intellectual creative works 
and the intellectual property regime constitutes of multiple legislations that basically protect various types of intellectual property now one must know that intellectual property is a fairly recent field and it is also an exponentially growing field uh, in a service based economy we are witnessing a paradigm shift uh, in the focus that corporations now have and the focus is now moved from acquiring property or tangible property to investing in intellectual assets or focusing on intellectual assets and with such a shift you will also notice that the rights that are associated to intellectual assets of individuals firms and businesses also require increased protection right because these are valuable assets these are valuable uh, assets that any individual or company can have so this is a very lucrative field and it's also quite exciting because it requires not just legal acumen but also an understanding and appreciation of creative works of technology so uh, these are some of the aspects that are there with respect to intellectual property laws or intellectual property and the rights that are associated with intellectual property so with this we come to the end of the session on sale of goods and property law i hope you found what we've covered useful thank you very much and the next session will be taken by professor valarmathi on marriage divorce and maintenance laws